very good morning to you. I'm Howard Feldman. It is Sunday, the 21st of March, 2021. This is the Synthesis Podcast with me, Howard Feldman, and Dr. Anton Marburg. Dr. Marburg, good morning. How are you? Good morning. Good thanks to you. Um, we're it? currently sitting... Mm-hmm. Well, uh, yeah, it's, it's quite, uh, in inverted commas, quiet at the moment. Mm-hmm. We're currently sitting on 123,488,431 cases worldwide with 2,723,061 deaths and 94 million cases recovered. The United States has 30.4 million cases with 554,000 deaths. And South Africa has 1,536,801 cases with 52,082 deaths. 1,378 new cases in the last 24 hours and a dismal 182,983 people having been vaccinated. We are currently lagging behind Zimbabwe. That's how bad it is. We have a recovery rate of 95%. Um, We know that in the Gauteng hospitals at the moment, there are 1,418 COVID patients with 290 in ICU and 156 ventilated. And the confirmed cases have plateaued around 1,200 per day with a test positivity rate of about 4.4%. Thanks. thanks. So are you saying that 182,000 South Africans have received the vaccine? Are you really saying that more people have watched this podcast than have been vaccinated? (laughs) That's exactly what I'm saying. And I'm also saying a country like Zimbabwe is in phase two of the vaccination um, status, whereas we are still not even through the first million people vaccinated in our country. It's it's really remarkable. I, I heard some things last week, um, some of the commentators saying, well, we're not that far behind. We're only a month. Well, you're only a month from the last target. Um, but uh, is, there, is there frustration? I know there's frustration on the streets. I know that a lot of people I speak to, social media, people I interact with are absolutely horrified as to how appallingly South Africa has done. We haven't really had ownership of, uh, of the fact that it's a debacle. What are doctors saying? What is, what is the medical fraternity saying? Look, doctors are as frustrated as people out there. Not all the doctors have been vaccinated. Not all the nursing staff have been vaccinated. Remember, the healthcare system is providing for about 1.2 million people. So if you look at 182,000 people, it means a large majority of the healthcare society or community has not been vaccinated. That being said, we're now going into Easter, we're going into Passover, and without vaccinating the majority of people, we know that this is unfortunately the catalyst or the stimulus for the third wave. So the doctors are arms up, no one to complain to, no one to fight against. You know, as you correctly said, no one's taken ownership of who should actually be dealing out the vaccines, barring the government who's supposedly dealing them out and and dishing them out. But as I said before, if they are doing that, is it a no weekend work vaccination type schedule or why aren't we getting the vaccines? Why aren't we hearing how many more vaccines are coming and when they are coming, where are they going? An interesting uh, thought or an interesting discussion that I had with somebody earlier today uh, was they said to me, well, the medical aids, private medical aids don't have the responsibility to vaccinate. All their responsibility is, is to pay for the vaccinations. That's quite confusing for somebody like me because we know that a lot of the medical aids have gotten quite involved in this. They're on the board of, or the executives of trying to procure vaccines. Would you agree with that statement? Yeah, I don't really understand it to say that uh, for these, especially since a lot of the bigger medical aids are into prophylactic medicine and preventing sort of diseases from getting out of control and looking at weight loss and looking at sugar control and looking at blood pressure control. So even more so, they should be involved in this, preventing people needing to be hospitalized, preventing severe disease, preventing mm-hmm. death. All right. So uh, so you, you believe that private medical aids are responsible, need to be involved, that's part of their function. No doubt about that. All right, great. Okay, let's just move on to some of the specifics. A few people are asking about the latest in treatment. What are you currently using? What are you seeing? What has developed lately? So there's still no game changers for treating COVID-19. There's no magic bullet. There's no magic potion, as we've said before. What we do know is that you can use a combination of monoclonal antibodies Bamlanivimab and Efezivimab, which are being used in the United States, 
which are extremely expensive, as we said before, and have to be used right at the beginning of the disease in the early stages for the mild to the moderate disease. We don't have access to them in this country. And what's interesting is that the Infectious Disease Society of the United States of America has warned against the use of ivermectin. They've also come out with a statement saying that hydroxychloroquine, ritonava, which is an HIV medication, and azithromycin, which is an antibacterial drug, do not work in COVID-19. So that's quite interesting that they're bringing these wow. things up now as we go along with the disease. That is incredible because these drugs were touted as the answer to it all, even from a prophylaxis perspective. Look, we've already, we've already got in our minds uh, a new drug for the third wave, which we believe people are going to be bringing. I'm not going to mention it yet, but one on. of those ones I'm, going to, I'm going to put it in my pocket in an envelope and I'm going to give it to you so you can open when, we, when it comes out for the third wave. So every wave has its medication that people see as the... As curative. The, as curative, as, as, as right. miraculous. Mm -hmm. Oh, come on, give us a hint. Not a chance. You have to wait for the Oscar. <laughs> All right, that's going to be very, very interesting, very interesting to see. Is there a difference between how men seem to be getting COVID and how women seem to be getting it? Or do we just complain a lot? Okay, so this is a, a very slippery slope. You've got to be very careful how I answer this. But there actually are sex differences in the immune response to, to viral infection. We know that women have a stronger interferon and a greater T cell activation and an increased susceptibility to autoimmunity. These are some of the ways that how women actually differ from males. What's been noted, and, and this is very important, is that men seem more likely to get much more severe COVID in hospital and die from the disease, whereas women seem to hold on to the disease for longer and suffer <laughs> from the disease and suffer from long COVID. So I'm not going to say much more oh, about wow. that. Wow, I don't know where to go with we can, this. We can take that forward. Hold on. So let me, let, me, let me take it a step back and say, before oh. I get into trouble, females tend to mount a much stronger immune response to viral infection. There's a definite, definite relationship between having two X chromosomes as well as estrogen. And that probably does explain why man flu is so serious in your garden variety male. And a recent uh, pilot study in the United States has actually been using progesterone. Now, progesterone is a hormone which is produced by the ovaries in a five-day treatment plan to actually help treat the side effects and the symptoms of significant COVID and has significantly improved the outcomes of this disease. So watch the space. We might see some interesting things coming forward. So what you're really saying is women don't suffer from COVID as badly in many cases, but they hold on to it. That's and exactly what I'm saying. Never forget it. Is that what it is? That's it. Long COVID. Wow, wow, wow. I, I actually don't even know where to go with that. I, 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 because, yeah, no good can come out of, no good can come De out of this conversation. De definitely not, man. All right. And are, are there still more myths around the, um, around the vaccines, around the treatment, around COVID? So there are. I mean, I, and, I, and I think it's important to dispel them once again. We know that the nanoparticles in COVID-19 vaccines cannot locate you in 5G networks. That's myth number one. Number two, fish tank cleaner does not kill or clear coronavirus. And more importantly, cocaine or marijuana do not kill coronavirus. They may kill the person, but they don't kill coronavirus. There's a doctor in the United Kingdom that sent out an 18-minute video saying that doctors who administer the vaccine are guilty of war crimes. Now, this is coming from the same doctor who denies the existence of HIV and AIDS. So we've got to take that with a pinch of salt. Um, a very other important uh, myth is that the Simpsons did not predict COVID-19. Yeah, I saw that. And, I thought that they did. Yeah, no, they truly didn't. And lastly, Pope Francis did not say that COVID-19 vaccine was required to get into heaven. Very important, that one. Wow. All right. The, 
the myths around COVID. It's amazing because we really are an incredibly imaginative people. If only we could use it for good and not for stupidity. Yeah. Let's, can we just talk about the uh, AstraZeneca vaccine? Because South Africa, I believe, is still sitting with a million doses if they haven't, uh, if they haven't been lost somewhere along the way. Uh, what yeah. is going on? They've been stopped. It's started. The blood clots. What, 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 just give us a sense of what's going on here. Okay, so there's been a lot of bad publicity for the AstraZeneca vaccine. Um, we know that there's about 30 to 50 cases of blood clots in 5 million vaccinations that have been administered. Now, if you look at that, that's negligible. What we don't know is did any of those patients have COVID? Were any of those patients had any other predisposing reasons why they could have got blood clots? It's a very minimal amount, and we need to know far more about it, and I don't believe it should be stopped or not given. I still am of the opinion that 18 to 30-year-olds in this country should be given the AstraZeneca vaccine if they are healthy and have no comorbidities. At least they've got some protection, and at least they'll have protection against severe disease or being necessitated to be admitted to hospital. And allows them to, to go back to living a relatively normal life, which makes a huge right. difference. And I think that's also very important what you just brought up there about living a, a relatively normal life. Remember, we've only got 182,000 people who are vaccinated in this country. We start to see a lot of people coming from overseas now who have been vaccinated. They mm. are coming here and they are taking off their masks and hugging everybody and saying, don't worry about me. I'm vaccinated. Don't worry. The problem with that, and as per Dr. Anthony Fauci, vaccinated people are still thought that they can spread the virus and they can possibly become reinfected, albeit not as bad as anybody else, it is still a worry. So even if you have come from overseas and you are vaccinated, you are still a potential threat. Obviously, if you're going into an area where everybody is vaccinated, you don't have to wear your masks. But, and a big caveat, is we don't know what the reaction is against the South African variant. So you've got to be very careful with that. In fact, recently, I admitted someone who came from overseas who has had both of the Pfizer vaccines. They've been admitted to hospital, a young person, extremely ill with multiple changes on their x-rays, with marked abnormalities in their bloods. And this is after one week after having their second Pfizer vaccine. So if you look at the numbers in Israel, they say there's about 570 to 580 people that have got COVID after having had the vaccines. It may be a small number, but it's still a reality. You still got to be careful. You still got to wear your mask after having been vaccinated to protect yourself and protect other people until we reach herd immunity. And remember, herd immunity occurs when a large part of the population becomes immune through either a vaccine or through an infection, and the virus basically has nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. Uh, Daphne says, thank you for an excellent podcast. I know you're not a fortune teller, but in view of the shocking vaccine rollouts, do you think that it is possible for us to travel uh, overseas in January as it will be my mother-in-law's 100th birthday and uh, it would be so special if we could be there? I think that's awesome. Well, ha happy birthday to your mother-in-law. You know, we've got to go by what we're seeing at the moment. You know, at the moment, we've got a dismal sort of outlay of our vaccines. But hopefully in the next few months, the numbers are going to increase dramatically. And please God, you will be able to go. Right. Let's uh, spend a moment because this is the last podcast ahead of Passover um, as well as Easter. Let's just talk about if you're getting together with families, what to do. Let's start off with, uh, with, with Easter. Okay. So I think the biggest problems we've got with any of these religious holidays is the communal gathering. And the communal gatherings, the biggest problem with that is they're normally done in a church service or a school service, that type of thing, where you've got multiple people together. You need to curb those services. You need to cut them down, keep them to small amounts of people, maximum of 50 to 100 people outside, people socially distanced, people wearing masks, and people following all the rules. When you take it one step further for a festival like Passover, if you are having people over, don't have too many people. Try not to have more than 10 people. If people at separate tables, try it outside. If not outside, separate the tables. And it's each family at a different table. Each family gets their own cider plate. Each family gets their own cutlery, crockery, their own cups of wine, their own bottles of wine. 
everyone in essence runs their own private sort of service or SADA that they can be in control of and there's no spread in between. What's very important to realize is that the SADAs can get very vocal, people start singing. You should still be wearing your masks if you are not eating. Albeit it's gonna be very hard, it is still necessary because as we know, the Easter and Passover festivals are now going to be the catalyst towards the third wave and we cannot afford a third wave like we had our second wave. Mm. Is it inevitable, the third wave? It is inevitable. You know, mm. even though the numbers have plateaued at the moment, in 1,200 to less than 1,500, we are slowly seeing an uptick of patients from the casualty point of view, towards the rooms, towards the hospitals. So the numbers are there and people have become lax. People have dropped their guard. People are not doing what they're supposed to be doing. So unfortunately, it is inevitable. There have been a number of weddings, I know, within within the community in the last in, in the last week. I know as well that the protocols at some of them were quite lax. I'm certainly not saying all of them. I wasn't at any of them, uh, but uh, which which actually in of itself is a bit of a problem. To, I don't seem to get invited out anymore. Uh, but that aside, let's just put that let's, let's just put that aside. Um, whose responsibility is it at these functions? Because I, you know, where, is it the entertainer? Is it the parents? Is it the caterer? Is it the hall? Whose responsibility is it to stand up and say, okay, hold on, everybody. This is going the wrong way. We need to be compliant here. Look, I think if you're having a function and you invite people, it should be your responsibility to make sure that it doesn't go the wrong way. I mean, I'm completely flabbergasted. I've seen pictures from weddings in the last week and People have basically said COVID doesn't exist anymore. There's no such thing as SARS-CoV-2. People have been hugging, dancing together, kissing each other, eating all at the same place in big groups. So, you know, it is definitely the responsibility of the people who are hosting the function, but more so it's our own responsibility. You know, you can't say it's somebody else's problem. It's our problem. We've mm -hmm. got to be responsible and say, you know, if we are there, we've still got to accept the norms of COVID-19 and actually do the social distancing, wear the masks, wash our hands, sanitize, and make sure we don't jump on top of each other, dance together. You know, we are still in a pandemic. We're still in a state of emergency or disaster in this country. So we are not out of it yet, and we are not going to be getting out of it very soon due to the behavior of people in these type of, type of circumstances. All right, uh, is there good news? Is good news. And the most important news, once again, as I say, this time last year, we were all locked up in our houses. Mm -hmm. We couldn't celebrate any of the festivals. We've now made it to East End Passover on level one. The numbers have plateaued. The case uh, test positivity rates are decreased. And of course, back to back wins for Liverpool against Leipzig and Wolves. I mean, this is it. We're back on track. Come on, you Reds. And now even better, we have a three-week international break to give us more strength and get us back on the road. And to quote, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. Be safe, have a good Passover, have a good Easter, try and follow all the rules. Remember, you're not only doing it for you, but you're doing it for everybody else. All the best and Godspeed. Thank you, Dr. Anton Marburg. I'm Howard Feldman. This has been the Sunday Synthesis Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe below. Also send us your questions and we will answer them. There will not be a podcast next week, Sunday, because it is uh, the Festival of Passover, but we'll be back with you in two weeks. In the meantime, be safe, be caring, be kind, and God bless. <music>